With personal experience living along the wall separating Israel and the Palestinian territories, I'm joined by Huweda Araf from Michigan, a Palestinian human rights activist and attorney. And from Arizona, Flo Rosowski is a photographer who is working on her project, Up Against the Wall, a look at border walls and their impact. Thanks to both of you for joining us. Huweda, let me start with you. You've spent a great deal of time living in the Palestinian occupied territories. The borders, of course, between Israel and those Palestinian territories have a great impact on people living there. You yourself have been affected. Tell us about your experience. I was, as you note, living in the occupied Palestinian territories when, in late 2002, Israel started erecting a wall, uh, saying that it is for security purposes, but in actuality, they started building a wall on occupied Palestinian land. And so what they did was confiscate a great deal of Palestinian land, bulldoze large amounts of agricultural uh, land, and separate people from, uh, from their sources of livelihoods, from their olive groves, some people from their families, from their work, from um, hospitals. And in many communities, they are completely surrounded by this wall. They cannot move without getting an Israeli permit. You have situations where um, it, Palestinian communities are living between Israel's built wall and the internationally recognized border between Israel and the occupied Palestinian territory. That's 10 percent of the land, thousands of people. And they have to get permits just to stay living in their homes. Uh, and so the practical effect of that is to make it nearly impossible for Palestinians to stay living on their land and, and to move. Palestinians want to live um, in peace and security, want to be able to live like normal human beings without being surrounded by uh, concrete walls and, and not being able to leave the confines of your own town without Israeli permission. Right. And for their part, the Israelis say the reason they constructed that wall was to prevent the number of uh, attacks against civilians, Israeli civilians as well as the Israeli military, and figures have shown us that the number has gone down considerably since the construction of the wall, right? I'm, I'm glad you raised that because they do say that, but if you look at just simple facts, you'll see that that is not true at all because um, the fact that it has gone down has a lot to do with also internal Palestinian politics. Uh, but leave that aside, the United Nations itself documented over a two-month period, despite Israel's wall, over a two-month period, at least 14,000 Palestinians made their way, quote-unquote, illegally over or around the wall in order to go into Israel proper and look for work. So despite this wall, Palestinians are still able to get over or around it to get into Israel. And so if they wanted to launch attacks on, Palis uh, on Israelis, um, a, a wall like this would not stop it. Huweda, uh, I want to get to another personal story of yours. When you uh, had children, you crossed the border, when you were pregnant rather, you crossed the border to deliver those children. What were the circumstances around that? Uh, well, what happened with me is that, because I actually have Israeli citizenship, which is what I wanted to pass along to my kids so that Israel won't ban them um, as it denies so many others entry uh, into the country. And when I had my second child, I was living in the occupied West Bank in Bethlehem, and the hospital that I was going to deliver at was in Jerusalem. And so it was a constant uh, stress when I, when it came time to go to the hospital, will I make it? Could I get through the Israeli checkpoints? Because over the years, many, many Palestinian women have been stopped in active labor, been stopped at checkpoints, been forced to deliver at checkpoints, and, and sometimes the women and their children uh, didn't make it, their, their newborn babies. Um, and, and while I have American and Israeli citizenship, and so I, I knew or was a little bit more confident that they couldn't necessarily do that to me. Any kind of uh, delays, you know, makes you anxious when you're in that kind of situation. Uh, and so I can only imagine Palestinians that only have Palestinian ID and that are completely at the mercy of the Israeli military, uh, the mothers, what they must be feeling like. Mine's just a very little uh, example of a, a much broader and more horrific situation. Okay, let's bring Flo in. Flo, you have embarked on a really interesting project here to document, to photograph these walls and separation barriers all around the world. We forget sometimes how many of these barriers exist uh, around the world. How do you do, did you get onto a project like this in the first place? Um, what started me on the project of Up Against the Wall was um, being able to spend time in occupied Palestine in 2002 
during the time that Hueda mentioned, um, when the wall that is in the West Bank that is currently more than 500 miles long was first being built. And so for me, the impetus to up against the wall was being in Palestine and watching the wall get built there. And it led me on this journey that has now been um, 15 years in the making that's still going on, getting to different places in the world where specifically so-called first world nations are building structures uh, where they bump up against so-called third world nations. Um, and for me, it's, um, it's important to continuously document these structures because once they're built, they constantly need to be maintained and developed. Uh, one thing that I've learned in, in this work is that when the nations build these borders, it doesn't stop the migration. You know, l largely people are migrating for economic reasons, to escape violence, um, and they're migrating to maintain their livelihood, to survive. And it's hard to um, let yourself be annihilated. So even though these right. structures are being built, people then just figure out how to go around them, how to go over them, and so the structures are constantly being developed. Flo, of course, we know about the impact that the Israeli separation barriers had on Palestinians living in that area, but in documenting these barriers around the world, where did you see the greatest effect in other parts of the world? You live along the United States-Mexico border. There is a fence there, we know. There is a barrier there. What kind of impact do you see there? Yeah, I, similarly to some aspects of, of the wall in Palestine, the southern U.S. border splits communities in half. It's um, a very good example of the saying, we didn't cross the border, the border crossed us. This, these are places that are uh, generations old, long before the border existed there, that are now cut in half, families ending up on both sides that um, either can't see each other or have a lot of difficulty uh, getting together. You also have um, where I live in Nogales, Arizona, um, where it's actually a 25-foot high steel beam structure. Um, you have US citizens that are constantly harassed because they live in proximity to that border, because um, their skin is brown, and because they speak Spanish as much as they speak English. Um, I think um, at, in places like uh, the, the Spanish border at Melilla, you have a situation where, uh, because the Spanish government feels the need to um, be presented as more civilized as part of the European Union, they simply pay the Moroccan government uh, approximately $40 million a year to more violently police that border. So you have an extremely heavy militarized presence there um, bumping up alongside a, a local population that is farmers, um, peasants. Hueda Araf, Flo Rosaski, thanks to both of you for joining us.